Um, <clears throat> yes, so today's the uh, the last lecture on on this uh, this series of talks about about uh, geometric invariant theory. Today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, this U hat theorem that, that I mentioned last time. I'm going to um, sketch out a nice proof of it um, using twisted affine uh, GIT. Um, but I, my aim is not just to give a proof of the theorem, but also to, along the way, give you a sense of uh, the kinds of concepts that you encounter when you think about these nominative group actions. Uh, and in particular, we're going to be thinking a lot about uh, GA actions today. So um, let me just remind you about what we saw yesterday. So last time we talked about H quotients or U hat quotients for uh, projectors where H we can always write recall them as a semi direct product of its unit radical um, and a reductive group. And uh, we assume always that this has graded unipotent radical. So what that means is that um, there is a uh, one parameter subgroup, a homomorphism from GM to the center of R, um, which acts by conjugation on the Lie algebra of U with weights that are all strictly positive. So that uh, condition so far might seem a little bit opaque or strange. And hopefully in the course of this lecture, I will kind of explain what that condition really does for us, because it's really the main thing that makes this whole story work. Okay, and the strategy um, to construct these quotients, um, as, I, as I mentioned last time, is uh, to first do uh, U quotients, uh, then, then R. So recall that um, if we have an action of H on something, then because U is on an algebra, then because U is normal, if we can sort out the U invariants, we then get an action of R, which is H mod U, on the U invariance uh, in A, and uh, we can then apply reductive GIT to that. So the point is that it suffices really to be able to do unipotent quotient in order to be able to do um, general linear algebraic groups once you have the reductive theory that I talked about in the second lecture. Okay, so we, we need to think a little bit about unipotent groups. Um, and this is the crucial fact about them that we're going to use. Um, so every unipotent group U has a, a sequence of normal subgroups uh, like this. So starting with the identity, uh, U2 to uh, let's say UL, which is U. And the crucial point here is that if I take the sub quotients in this filtration, every one of them is isomorphic to GA. Okay. And applying this principle again, that we can quotient as it were in stages by first quotienting by a normal subgroup and then looking at the residual action of the quotient by that normal subgroup and iterating this process. Um, the, 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 the point of this is to say that if we can do GA, then we're in a good position to do unipotent groups. And if we can do unipotent groups, we're in a good position to do arbitrary linear algebraic groups. So all of this to say that we're going to be thinking a lot about GA actions because that's really the basic building block of, of what we need. So, um, so if we can quotient by GA actions, um, we can use induction. So, of course, there's a little bit more to it than just use induction, but, um, you know, hopefully that's that's plausible enough. Okay. And in any case, if you want to quotient by non-reductive groups, GA is the simplest one, so it makes sense to understand GA in detail anyway. Okay. So, um, and the other thing that I've tried to make clear in, in this um, series of talks is that we want to really construct our quotients locally. You know, we want affine locally things to be spec of invariants. So it suffices really to be able to understand what's going on for affine things. So we've reduced this whole problem from linear algebraic group with graded unipotent radical acts on, say, a projective variety, all the way down to now we have a GA action on an affine scheme. Okay, so, so we consider... Uh, GA acting on X, which is spec A, um, some affine scheme uh, or variety, if you like. Um, okay, so, um, and recall we're working over an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero, uh, as has been pointed out in some of the other talks. Um, 
this week. If uh, the characteristic is P, then things get much more complicated. And in particular, a lot of what I'm going to say today will just not work at all in characteristic P for reasons that will shortly become obvious. Okay, so what is a GA action on an affine, uh, an affine variety or scheme? So, well, we we heard um, in Harm Dirksen's talks about coactions. Um, so, by considering the coaction, uh, this is the same as a coaction, uh, which I call sigma upper star, and that's going to go from A to uh, A tensor, um, the polynomial ring in one variable, um, because this thing here is is O of G when G is uh, G A. Okay. Right. And then there's something special about GA actions, which is there is another way to describe them. Um, and that's something we're really going to exploit because it makes life tons easier. So I need to give you a definition. So a derivation D of a K algebra uh, is a K linear map, a K linear map satisfying the Leibniz rule. So that's the, that is to say that D of FG is D of F G plus uh, F of DG, okay. So it's something a little bit like a differential operator, okay. Um, and then I'll call a derivation um, locally nilpotent if uh, for all F in A, there exists N greater than zero, such that D to the N F equals zero, okay. So the uh, paradigmatic example would be A is a polynomial ring in one variable, say X, and the derivation is just differentiation with respect to X. If you differentiate a polynomial enough times, it becomes zero, right? So that's the, that's the paradigmatic example to keep in mind. Okay. So why am I talking about derivations? Um, that's because of the following uh, proposition, which says, uh, that a derivation is essentially the same thing as a GA action. So there is a bijective uh, correspondence between, on the one hand, GA actions uh, on affine schemes spec A, and on the other side, uh, locally nilpotent derivations. Uh, D from A to A. Okay, so let me just show you what this correspondence does. So if I have a GA action on the left-hand side, I can think about its co-action. So let's say the uh, if I have a derivation here, then how do I get a GA action on spec A? Well, I can get that by specifying the co-action, and um, the co-action needs to be um, needs to be a map like this. And um, so I can define sigma upper star of f given D. Uh, to be uh, essentially the exponentiation. Uh, so I take the sum over n greater than equal to zero of d to the n f over n factorial times t to the n. So this will be a polynomial uh, uh, with coefficients in a, uh, a polynomial in t. So, you know, this, this here is a of t, right? So. I need to specify a polynomial with coefficients in A, and that's exactly what this is. And of course, this thing here is not going to work at all in characteristic P, right? So that's a, a fairly obvious place where if the characteristic is not zero, you're really gonna have to do something different. Okay, so that's the correspondence in one direction. What's the correspondence in the other direction? Um, so if I'm given, if instead I'm given uh, the coaction, then I need to define a derivation. And the derivation can be defined to be, uh, I take the coaction on F. So that is going to be um, a polynomial in T with coefficients in A. And I just differentiate that polynomial at T equals zero. And that gives me, um, one can check that this satisfies the Leibniz rule. Um, and it's going to be locally nilpotent because sigma per star of F is going to be a polynomial. So if you differentiate it enough times, you'll, you'll get a zero. So you can check that this this uh, is a bijective correspondence. Um, and one other thing that is um, really handy, which is really relevant for us, is that, okay, so we're interested in um, 
we're interested in invariance, right? Because the quotient to be locally spec of invariance. So we, we could ask, well, what does this correspond to in terms of the derivation? And it's very, very nice um, because it corresponds to the kernel of the derivation. So the way to think about this is that um, if I have a GA action, that's like a sort of uh, flow on X. And if I differentiate that at zero, then that's the infinitesimal action. And so sort of being in the kernel of the infinitesimal action is is to do with being invariant. This should be the same thing. It's, it's very much like a Lie algebra, Lie group correspondence, uh, if you if you like. Okay, so let me give you let me give you an example just to to make this more precise. Okay. So here's an example. So if I have G A acting on let's say three dimensional affine space, so I can specify an action like this. Uh, let's say X goes to X plus a Y plus a squared over two Z y goes to y plus a z and z goes to z so this is a reasonable action of ga on a cubed and what does this correspond to in the, in the derivation picture um well it's, it's a little simpler which is nice it just says dx is y dy is z and dz is zero right so z is invariant so z should be in the kernel of the derivation and um you can check that if you follow through this correspondence then this action here corresponds to this here and you know th th this sort of looks nicer it's something a little bit more linear looking than than this okay so that's very that's very good so um we're really going to be talking about derivations rather than ga actions um for a lot of today and the reason is that they're a little simpler to think about even though they're really equivalent okay right um oh yeah and then one other thing i um want to say is that um so just this will be sort of relevant later. So if I'm given a derivation and I'm given F in the kernel of the derivation, uh, which recall is the same as the GA invariance, then I get uh, an induced, uh, I'll call it DF from A localized to F to A localized to F, um, which just does kind of what you'd guess. Uh, it just applies uh, D to the top of the fraction. Um, but the point is, because f is invariant, it's in the kernel, this is the same thing that you get if you just applied the quotient rule for differentiation to this. Okay, so what that says is that um, if I have a, an affine scheme, and f is, an, is ga invariant, so the non-vanishing of f will specify for me a, a ga invariant affine open, then I get an induced ga action on that invariant affine open. And I'm telling you here, this is what the, this is what the derivation uh, is. Okay. Um, uh, and then one other thing I wanted to mention is that um, given uh, I, an ideal of A with um, DI contained in I, then you get D from A mod I to uh, A mod I. Okay. Um, and then a crucial thing. Um, so one of the last time we talked about the assumptions that you need to put on general linear algebraic groups in order uh, for there to be a chance that something like GIT is going to work. And there were two assumptions. One of them was to do with the graded unipotent radical, which we'll get to. And the other one was about stabilizers, right? We want there to be no stabilizers in, in uh, no U stabilizers in Z min. So it's worth asking, you know, what, what does it mean to be fixed under a GA action in terms of this derivation perspective? Um, and it's also very simple. So one can check that um, a point is in GA uh, fixed locus if and only if D of A is contained in the maximal ideal corresponding to that X. So now we have a nice criterion here, which allows us to, to figure out what the fixed point locus is given only the deriv derivation, right? Okay, so that's all just some stuff on, on, on locally nilpotent derivations and their relationship to GA actions. So to return to our our theme of quotients. So um, when can we expect uh, a GA quotient to exist? And this, recall, can be a very subtle question, right? So there are, there are various examples exhibiting all sorts of strange pathological behavior. Um, and so what we do, the strategy here, is to focus on uh, a very in some sense, the nicest possible case, which is the case where there exists a slice. Okay, so 
I'll give you this definition, uh, a slice, uh, well, let's see, a slice for um, a GA action on X is um, S in A, such that when I apply the associated, uh, the, the derivation that corresponds to this GA action, I get one. Okay, so that's a slice. Um, and this proposition tells you that this deserves to be called a slice. So the following are equivalent. Um, one is there exists a slice, uh, S in A. Two is um, A is isomorphic to the uh, GA invariants, polynomials in S with GA invariants, and D is differentiation with respect to S. Uh, and the third is that there exists uh, an equivariant uh, isomorphism uh, from X, which is spec A uh, to uh, X prime cross A1 uh, for some affine X prime. So the GA action here is trivial on here, and it's just acting by the standard GA action on A1 here. And that sort of corresponds to this derivation of, of this um, variable. So in other words, there is a uh, globally trivial quotient. The, the projection map from X, which is just this, onto X prime is a um, it's a trivial uh, a trivial GA bundle, if, if you want. It's a trivial quotient. So there's a particularly nice geometric quotient. Okay, so that's the, that's the significance of this. If we have S in A such that D of S is one, then we're very happy because it means there is a, a globally trivial quotient for the GA action. Um, okay, and uh, so let, let me bring in the idea of the grading here. So um, you'll notice that this ring has a natural grading, namely the degree in S, okay? Um, so if there's a slice, then, you know, by two, A is isomorphic to, I take the invariance, polynomials in S with the uh, coefficients of the invariance. So this um, is graded. Uh, it's a graded width, right? It's graded in the usual sense. Um, and this tells me that the GA action extends to a GM action. So a GM action on an affine scheme is the same thing as a, a structure of the, a graded ring on uh, on its uh, coordinate ring, right? So this is this gives me a, an action of GA cross GM, a semi-direct product GM, um, where um, uh, if all, uh, ah, yeah, okay. So let me let me actually just specify for convention reasons. I want a n to be uh, s to the minus n a g a. So I'm uh, normally you would grade this algebra positively because that's kind of the sensible thing to do. But for sign convention reasons, I'm going to make it negatively graded. So uh, the degree n, the degree minus n part is the homogeneous polynomials of, of degree n in S. Um, and, and the reason for that is because um, uh, then the GM uh, grades um, the GA action. And by, by this, I mean, it, it grades in the sense of graded unipotent radical that I said last time, right? Um, so you can, one way of thinking about this graded unipotent radical condition is that when you think about the, the action of the GM, you so the affine locally, the action of the GM corresponds to a grading on the ring. And if the uh, that GM grades the unipotent radical, that means that when I apply a U element, it pushes me up the weight space. So everything moves in, in just one direction. It moves upwards. Uh, I think I mentioned that last time. Um, uh, Oh, yeah. And the other thing to observe is that because, so this is the reason for this convention uh, here, that since uh, all weights are negative, um, the limits as t goes to zero, this so this this GM I'm going to call lambda, the one that corresponds to the grading, which is this, this grading here, um, this exists for all x in x. So what I'm saying is that if you're in the presence of a slice, then you you naturally have uh, the graded unipotent radical condition because you can write down a GM action 
such that it grades the unipotent uh, action. And moreover, as well as having the uh, a GM which grades the GA action, you also have um, that uh, for that GM action, limits as T goes to zero exist. So the only reason for the side convention is if I didn't do this, I'd have to write infinity here and I, I don't want to do that. So that's why I'm doing it this way around. Okay. Okay, great. So, um, uh, yeah, could you repeat the question? I'll follow the slides. Um, yeah, so if you take, if you take a, <clears throat> a polynomial ring in one variable over a field, say, and the uh, the G the G and um, that's the slice because D of X. If you differentiate X, you get one. Uh, sorry, Josh. So that's frozen telling frozen. you that the. Um... Uh, sorry, you got frozen for just a second. Can you? Give us ah, okay. Sorry. Let, let me let me repeat what I said. So, if you take a polynomial ring in one variable over a field, then that's the coordinate ring of a one. A one has a standard GA action, which is just translation, and the derivation corresponding to that standard action is just differentiating the polynomial in you know, in the normal. Way. And so, if I uh, take the polynomial x and I differentiate it, I get one. So that has a slice. Um, so that tells me that um, you know both of these two conditions must be satisfied. Not that interest here is, is is empty, so it's just telling me x is equivariant the isomorphic to a one, which of course you know it is because it literally is a one with its standard GA action. Um, so that's maybe a um, that's like the most trivial example you could uh, you could think of, and. Um, with respect to this grading thing, you, you'll find that you know, as well as having a standard uh, a standard action of uh, you know uh, a locally impotent derivation differentiation, the polynomial ring also has a standard grading, right? And if you take that standard grading, that corresponds to a GM action on a one, which is just contracting everything down to zero, and so all the limits as t goes to zero exist because it just takes you down to the origin, and that GM action. Uh, if you unravel the definition that I gave uh, last time, that will grade the GA action, which corresponds to the derivation, which is just differentiation. So that's a lot of definitions to unwind, but if you do it, you, you'll see that it's all it's all there. So that's maybe that's the like the simplest example. Okay. Um, so, oh, I should say that uh, that um, this this stuff about locally nilpotent derivations. Um, there's a book called. Uh, Algebraic theory of locally impotent derivations, I think, and that's that's where you can find lots and lots of stuff about this. Because people write entire books about this subject, so there's lots and lots of stuff here, and um, I certainly um, don't know uh, most of it. Okay, um, right. So this is to say, if there is a slice, then there is a um, uh, you can write down a, a globally trivial quotient in the sense that it's the the the, the, the original space is its quotient cross a one. Um, but you know we were doing GIT, right? So we're in the business of maybe not getting a quotient everywhere, but maybe just getting a quotient in some places. Uh, so that motivates the definition of a local slice. Um, so a local slice um, is um, S in. Uh, so it's in the kernel of D squared, but it's not in the kernel of D. Okay. Um, so what what's the uh, What's the point of this definition? Well, if S is um, is is a local slice with, you know, let's say D X is T, which is not zero, um, we get uh, a slice um, S over T, um, which is going to be an A localized at T uh, for uh, the induced uh, D T. Uh, from A localized at T to A localized at T. So this corresponds to a slice on, uh, you know, the open set UT inside X. So that's why it's called a local slice, okay? Um, wherever, you know, you differentiate it, wherever that T doesn't vanish, um, you get a, a slice there. So 
you know, it's not always it, it's not always going to be everywhere because um, this thing is not necessarily one, but on some open set you will get it. In fact. Um, yeah, so let me just uh, um, let me just say that again, um, so we can construct um, a locally trivial quotient uh, away from um, what they call the plinth ideal. Uh, the plinth ideal. Ideal. Uh, and the plinth ideal is the L of A, and this is the kernel of D intersected with the image of D. Um, so if you want to, you can think of this as being in some sense like a, a the, 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 this ideal corresponds to a closed subset, which is sort of like the GA unstable locus, if you want. Because away from this, you can write down a locally trivial quotient, because uh, everywhere that you know, you're not in here, you can find a local slice. Okay. Um, however, uh, but you'll see that this involves this kernel of D, right? And the kernel of D is the invariance. And I've said a lot that computing invariance is hard, um, uh, especially for um, non reductive groups. Okay, we would have to know the invariance in general to be able to say what this is, or at least a priori you would. Okay, so um, this is what, what the grading does for us. Um, this is uh, this is why we uh, need the grading, the grading condition. So um, so now let's restrict ourselves, we were talking just about GA actions on affine schemes, but now let's restrict ourselves to the situation where we have um, a grading as well, where the, the unipotent radical of the GA is actually graded. So now, um, suppose we have, so now we would have a GA semi-direct product of GM action on X, an affine scheme, spec A, um, where the GM uh, acts on the Lie algebra of GA uh, with um, weight, uh, let's say L greater than zero. So it's a, it's a one dimensional vector space. So the, the, this is a one dimensional representation. So I just have, have a number and I want that number to be positive because that's the grading condition. Um, so what does this give me? Well, this tells me that A, because it has a GM action, it's a graded ring. Uh, oh, wait, uh, let's do it like this. So, a is a graded ring. This grading is just the weight decomposition for the GM action on A. Uh, and the crucial thing, which is really the whole point of this grading condition, like I would, I would argue that the, the essence of why graded unipotent radical is useful is that the, the means that the associated derivation corresponding to this GM at GA action is gonna send AM to A M plus L, right? And that is really the, that's super important um, because that's really the, the crux of why this whole business works. And the reason that this is true is, is purely for representation theory reasons. If you've done representation theory of, you know, SL2, um, I said this last time, I think that, you know, if you have a um, something from a particular uh, root space, it has a particular weight vector for the Cartan and you take a weight vector in a representation, um, and you act by that weight vector in your Lie algebra, then it will push you from, you know, the, the weight space you started with to the weight space, weight you started with plus the weight for the Cartan of the element you applied. So that's, that's what this, that's just another version of this really, because I told you that the correspondence between GA and actions and derivations is analogous to a correspondence between um, uh, Lie groups and Lie algebras. That's really what's going on here. So this is like an infinitesimal uh, story. Okay. Okay. So this is a proposition which is uh, going to illustrate why we make this assumption on the grading. Okay. So suppose that um, we have some graded 
GA, similar direct product GM acting on X, which is spec A, such that uh, all limits exist. Um, so by this, I mean, you know, all limits uh, as T goes to zero of lambda T X or lambda T uh, in the GM. So when I say all limits exist, I mean under the GM action as T goes to zero. Um, okay. And then the conclusion is that um, there exists a slice for this action if and only uh, the action is free. So um, the, uh, the point being that whether we have fixed points is a relatively easy condition to check. Um, and Sorry, we're just having a little problem with our speaking. One moment while we sort this out. We good? Yep. We ah, great. Sorry about that. Um, okay, we're back. Um, yes. So the point is that we 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 saw that you know we need um, we need the uh, G action to have no fixed points, or at least to have constant dimensional stabilizers, if we're going to have any hope of a good quotient existing. And the point of this proposition is to say that, you know, if we have this condition and we're in the presence of a grading, then we get a slice for free. And that's like the nicest possible situation. So let me just write down the proof. So um, this is um, the, the GA fixed locus is, is empty. That's if and only if one is in the image of uh is in the ideal generated by the image of the derivation that's because um of this here so you're a fixed point if and only if the uh, ideal generated by the image of the derivation is contained in the corresponding maximal ideal so you know if you want to unwind that you need to have one be in the ideal generated by the image of the derivation to have no fixed points at all because it can't be contained in any maximal ideal right um but in particular, it would actually have to be in degree zero. The degree zero graded part of one is degree zero, because K is going to be in degree zero. Um, and well, what is the image of um, the derivation in degree zero? This is just D applied to A of minus L. OK. So one thing that I need to emphasize is that the image of a derivation is not an ideal in general. It's, it's uh, something else. So you, you have to take the ideal generated by it um, if you want to have an ideal. However, the um, the nice thing here is that you here you don't have to you don't have to talk about the ideal generated by you just you can just talk about this because um, if you unwind what happens with the Leibniz condition, you'll see that it's uh, uh, it, it's not necessary. Okay, so putting this stuff together, we get at uh, what we we call the key proposition. Um, I think this was a name that that. Uh, that Vicky Hoskins came up with in, in the survey that I mentioned um, last time, which again, I recommend, it's really good. Uh, okay, so let's put these together. Okay, so here we get the key proposition. Okay, and it says, if I have a GA action on an affine scheme, uh, spec A, which is X, then the following are equivalent. So the first one is there exists a slice for the GA action. And the second one is um, the, uh, the GA action extends to uh, a semi-direct product GA GM action on X such that um, all limits exist in, uh, in this sense. And um, we have the stabilizer condition. So the stabilizer in GA is trivial uh, for all Z in um, Z, where uh, Z is the set of limit points, uh, lambda. Oops. So that's T goes to zero, lambda T X, such that X is in X. So we have this picture, the GM action gives us this picture where we have 
z here, and then we have a lot of things that flow down to z as t goes to zero. Um, so this should really remind you of z min and x naught min, right? Okay, so um, the way that I would read this key proposition is to say that, you know, uh, well, I've argued that we need to make this, we need this stabilizer condition if we're going to think, so if things are going to work. The grading condition, however, seems a little bit less natural, perhaps a little bit more um, like it's plucked out of thin air. But this proposition tells you that it's really not. Um, it's, it's in some sense equivalent to there being a slice. And uh, uh, there being a slice is obviously a, you know, that's obviously a good thing. Okay, so now I've got the key proposition um, and told you a little bit about um, these GA actions. I can uh, sketch out a proof of the, uh, the U hat theorem. So let's do that. Sorry, Josh. Yes. Um, I'm a bit confused here why, so we have the stabilizer as trivial condition, but before we saw that uh, if there exists a slice, then your uh, uh -huh. find scheme X is isomorphic to like sort of a trivial A1 bundle over something else. And in that picture, uh -huh. I, like, at least I assume that uh, all, stabili all stabilizers are trivial. <coughs> Acting on the A1 yes. So, yeah, that's absolutely right. So if you if you have a slice, then you get this stabilizer condition for free. So the I, I guess the interesting part of the proposition it, that that implication, the interesting part of it is I, yeah, yeah. if there's a slice, then there's a grading as well as the stabilizer condition. Um, but in some ways, the more interesting part of the proposition is the converse. Two implies one. Yeah. I would say. Um, but you're absolutely right. If there's a slice, then you have to have no stable. Otherwise, yeah, it, 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 it won't be a slice. Okay. Good questions while we're here. Good. Okay, I'll carry on. Okay, so now I can sketch out the proof of the U-hat theorem. Um, so this, as I mentioned last time, is really based on um, using uh, sort of uh, twisted affine GIT or, or some kind of relative GIT, if you like which is, um, uh, was an idea suggested by David Ridd. Okay, so I'll just give you the uh, steps, right? So recall the, recall the setting. We've got, um, we've got X inside PN, we've got U hat acting on that, and we've got, um, we've got Z min, which is um, V min intersected with X, and above that, X naught min, uh, which flows down under P. Um, so this is, uh, this is P inverse of Z min, where this P map takes a point in X to its limit point under lambda as T goes to zero. So that's the setting. Okay, so the first observation is um, that you want to work affine locally uh, over uh, Z min. So um, let's, uh, let's draw draw a picture of the kind of thing we're going to be talking about. So I've got Z min here, and I've got X naught min here with P. And so I'm going to take some Z inside here, which is going to be affine. And then I'm going to take P inverse of Z here, uh, which is just the pre image of that under P. And um, this is affine. So I'm going to um, denote this as spec A naught. And this is going to be spec A, um, where A is a uh, negatively graded ring. So the grading is going to come from the GM action. X naught min has a GM action. Um, and when I flow down to, uh, the point is that this map P is affine. So if this is affine, when I take the pre-image, I get something affine. So I have spec A, this is a graded ring. And what's it's, uh, it's negatively graded because all limits exist as I take uh, T to zero under the GM action for X naught min. And what's the degree zero part? Well, it's just the, it's the, the, the fixed point set. So this, that's why this is spec of A0. This is the degree zero part of its graded ring. So that takes this sort of projective question and turns it into something more affine. Okay. So you could, if you wanted to, um, uh, you could, if you wanted to generalize this whole situation. So you don't, you know, you could, you could sort of start off in a situation like this, or if you want, you could start off with X and um, 
an appropriate sheaf of algebras on, uh, sorry, you can start off with Z and an appropriate sheaf of algebras on Z whose uh, relative uh, spec gives you something that plays the role of X naught min. Um, but I'm just gonna talk about the, the sort of classical U hat theorem uh, today. Okay. Um, right, so GM uh, acts on, uh, I'm gonna call this thing Y. So GM acts on Y uh, and Z is the set of limit points. Uh, y, Y and Y. Um, yeah, and as I said, this is spec of A naught. Okay. So that just comes from the uh, the fact that we have the GM action on X naught min. Okay. So then we want to reduce from the unipotent quotient to a GA quotient. So we choose this uh, we choose this um, series normal subgroups uh, that I mentioned before with UI over UI minus one isomorphic to GA. Okay. Um, okay, and then you consider um, what I'll call U hat one, which is you take uh, you take this group here, and you do a semi-direct product with degrading GM uh, like this. Okay, and this acts on Y. So now we're in a situation which is uh, really. Uh, similar to the key proposition. Well, it's exactly the situation of the key proposition because I have an action of, um, uh, hang on, put an X there. Um, I have an action of GA semi-direct product GM on X and um, all the limits are gonna exist as T goes to zero and the stabilizer uh, for the limit point is always gonna be trivial because the assumption of the U hat theorem is that if I look in Z min, I have trivial U stabilizers there, okay. Um, so now we can use the key proposition. Um, so that tells us uh, there exists a slice for this GA action, uh, S1, if you like, uh, in A. Uh, and uh, A is isomorphic to the uh, invariance for this GA action polynomial ring in A1 um, and is finitely generated. In particular, it's finitely generated. Um, um, well, that means that we get, uh, we can take spec of A U1, um, uh, which is going to be a, a trivial uh, quotient of Y by GA because it's a slice. Um, <laughs> Okay, and then you just sort of apply induction. You've got U2 over U1, um, that acts on Y mod GA. Um, this thing is still affine, so I'm exactly in the situation I was, but you know, one step, one step further. Um, so um, induction, uh, we get that AU is finitely generated. Okay, um, right. So this is where the uh, the twisted affine business comes in. Okay, so now we consider <clears throat> the twisted affine quotient. So, so far, all of this was really just to get the U invariance uh, being finitely generated. Um, so we consider the twisted affine um, quotient by U hat, which is uh, proj. I said at the end of last time, this is proj of I take a polynomial ring in one variable and I look at the U invariance where the U hat invariance where the U hat action uh, on W is via um, a character um, chi U hat to uh, U hat mod U GM. So this character chi is really, it corresponds to lambda. So um, you essentially have up to scaling, up to scaling by a positive multiple, you have two choices of character. You basically it points upwards or it points downwards because it's sort of a character of GM um, essentially because, and this is crucial, unipotent groups do not have any characters. 
So any character has to factor through the quotient by the unipotent radical. So it's essentially just a character of GM. Okay. Um, right. And then the um, the claim, I guess, is that the U hat invariants, so not the semi invariants, but the actual honest invariants, are just A naught. <coughs> Uh, so it's just the stuff that corresponds to the fixed point set for the GM action. Um, and the proof is that A0 is uh, U invariant um, by uh, the grading condition. The point is that when I act by um, the GA, A0 has to go to um, A0 plus L, where L is the weight. Um, but this is zero. I mean, there's nothing here. This is... This is nothing because this is positive and the ring is negatively graded. So I'm in the, uh, the sort of maximal weight space for the GM. When I apply the GA, I have to get sent to zero. So I have to be in the kernel of the derivation. Um, therefore, I have to be invariant for the GA. And so this is this is this step six is like really, really helpful because it enables us to write down what the U hat invariants are. Okay. And th so this is something like the quotient with respect to the borderline linearization in, 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 um, in David Ritt's terminology. It's, it's closely related to that. Okay. Um, so that tells us that um, the twisted quotient uh, is thus projective over Z. Because when I take the twisted affine quotient, um, it's proj of a graded ring. And the degree zero part of that ring is the U hat invariance. So the twisted affine quotient is projective over the actual untwisted quotient, and um, that has a map to um, that has a map to Z because the U hat invariants are exactly A naught. So in other words, A naught lives inside this ring as the degree zero part. So it's projective over it's projective over that. Okay. Um, so um, hence. Uh, when we glue, so this is all on an affine local thing, we get something um, projective over Z min, hence uh, projective over K. Because Z min is, um, remember, uh, where's it gone? Z min is this, right, which is a closed subvariety of X. So it's projective over K, because X is projective. Okay. Um, so this gives me a projective, um, something which is projective over Z min and hence projective. But the um, the question I think George asked yesterday was about, you know, could you do this kind of over something else and get something that was projective over that something else? And, and indeed you can. And this is the whole business with, I take some scheme and I take a sheaf of algebras on it. Um, and I take relative spec of that, and that relative spec plays the role of x naught min. The original scheme plays the role of z min, et cetera, et cetera. And you can get a quotient um, which is projective over that base. Um, and that's, um, as I said, that's something that uh, Vicky Hoskins and, and Eloise Hamilton and I are uh, thinking about how you how you sort of generalize this. Uh, okay, cool. So um, what have we got so far? We've got a um, a good quotient of a certain open subset as yet unspecified, which is projective because it's projective over Zedmin. So the, the, the final thing we need to do is we need to ascertain what the semi-stable locus is. And the claim here is that Y chi SS, which recall is the locus where there is a non-vanishing chi to the N semi-invariant for some N, uh, and that's the locus of definition of the twisted affine quotient, as I said at the end of last time, the claim is that that is exactly uh, y minus uz. So this is your, you know, this is your x naught min minus the u sweep of z min uh, after gluing. Okay. Um, and um, I won't prove this in the interest of time, um, but you can check it directly just purely from the definition. It's really not hard at all. Um, the point is that I'll just say it in words. So, if you're not in the U sweep of uh, of Z, then because the U quotient is geometric, because we have slices for it, so you construct the U quotient by first taking a slice with respect to one GA, then you get an induced action of another GA. You take a slice with respect to that, 
you iterate this process. So the U quotient is a um, is a is a composition of geometric quotients. It's therefore geometric. So if I start with something which is outside of this locus, um, then that means that um, it has to be separated from the image of this locus by some invariant. Um, and uh, that will be a, a, a U hat semi invariant because I can choose something which vanishes on the image of this, um, which will therefore have um, weight strictly positive because the locus that vanishes, the functions that vanish on the degree zero part are exactly the things that live in, that are sums of things in uh, positive weight spaces. So anyway, the point is, is it, it's like two lines. You can, you can prove this. Um, and then uh, conversely, you get, you get the other inclusion. So this is really not difficult to show. Um, okay, and then the final step here is, um, hence if we gluing, if we glue this, then we get um, a geometric uh, quotient of uh, x naught min minus u z min, um, which is projective uh, over z min, hence projective over k. Um, so all of this is really just a, a more kind of um, middle brow version of some of the stuff that David Ridd has has talked about. Um, it's a little bit more explicit. Um, so as I said before, this uh, this generalizes very nicely outside of the setting of projective GIT. So you could you could have a scheme with a sheaf of algebras on it, and you could make sense of what it means to have a derivation of that, like a derivation of a sheaf of algebras and so on. Um, and you can construct these quotients in a kind of relative GIT uh, way, which will give you something projective over, over the base. OK, um, so that's, that's uh, the end of that, uh, that proof, um, which I think is um, it's kind of illuminating to um, what the grading is really doing for us. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I'll just mention a couple of applications of, of this. Right. So applications, just to uh, remind you of some of the applications I've mentioned as we go along. Okay, so the first one is to do with um, uh, HKKN strata. Um, so this is to, this is for moduli spaces of unstable objects. So the, the the program here is you know first you you set up um, your moduli problem uh, using reductive GIT. So you know examples of this might be uh, curves, sheaves. Uh, I don't know, Higgs bundles um, or, uh, I don't know, quiver representations. You know, there's lots and lots of things you can do with, with reductive GIT. Um, so that's the first thing. And then you, um, you sort of analyze um, the HKKN stratification for your GIT setup. Um, and you get uh, sort of uh, moduli uh, theoretic interpretation. So the paradigmatic example of this would be um, harden error seam and type. Seam and type uh, for uh, sheaves or vector bundles. So this was a, a result that I mentioned um, mentioned earlier um, due to Hoskins and Kerwin um, uh, for uh, sheaves on a projective ski. And then the third thing is you use um, non-reductive GIT to quotient unstable strata um, to get uh, moduli spaces uh, classifying uh, all objects, not just semi-stable ones. So the idea here is that you should think of the classical, uh, the classical approach to moduli problems, where you, you know, you you, you get a moduli space for objects satisfying some nice semi-stability condition. You should think of that as just the first step, 
uh, you do that for the open stratum and then you look at all the other strata and all the other strata you have to, to if you're doing it with GIT, you can't quotient it with reductive GIT, you have to use non-reductive GIT. Um, and um, so uh, there's a, um, I guess I'll mention um, a theorem in, in, in this direction, which is um, due to Vicky Hoskins and, and, and myself, um, which uh, I won't state all the assumptions, but it's the standard, um, uh, well, the assumption you really need is about trivial U stabilizers. Um, the, uh, the upshot of it is that you can quotient uh, unstable H, K, K, N strata under um, reasonable uh, U-stabilizer conditions. Um, so the, um, the reason I'm writing reasonable U-stabilizer conditions is that if you have trivial stabilizers in Z beta SS, that will be enough. Um, but if not, there are various other things you can do. So there are various generalizations of the U-hat theorem um, that you can prove, which don't rely on having exactly that condition, but the conditions can get a little bit intricate. So I don't want to specify exactly what they are. Um, um, but um, uh, one application of this, um, uh, you can get uh, moduli spaces of unstable sheaves uh, uh, on a projective scheme. Okay, so that's the first major family of applications, which is unstable strata, moduli of unstable objects, and so on. Okay, so uh, let me just mention the other one, uh, another one, I should say, um, and this I I uh, mentioned in passing before at the beginning of last time, and that's um, moduli of uh, hypersurfaces in um, a weighted uh, projective space. Um, so this uh, this will be like vanishing of some degree d weighted homogeneous polynomial in um, uh, with weight a. Um, so this there are um, results. Dominic Gwinnett and um, other results which are uh, joint with myself and, and Dominic Gwinnett um, uh, as well. So this is a, a situation in which you uh, emphatically do not have the trivial U stabilizer condition uh, much of the time. So again, you have to have a little bit of ingenuity and uh, prove new theorems in non-reductive GIT in order to get around that. <laughs> nevertheless, it does work. Okay, uh, and then finally, uh, the, uh, what I'll call the big application, um, uh, which is to hyperbolicity. So this is something that um, <clears throat> we heard a little bit about yesterday, and I understand that um, uh, the, the next talk is, I think, going to be uh, Greg Berksy, who's going to be telling us uh, uh, more about this. Um, so that's, that's everything I have to say. Thank you. Questions here in Cambridge? Yes. Um, can I ask about an um, application of application one? If you go yes. back in time, um, a lot of the genesis of thinking about these unstable strata go back to the paper of Atia and Bot, who used yes. equivariant strata, or in some sense, the cohomology of the of the strata as a stack in an iterative uh, construction to actually understand the cohomology of the moduli space of semi-stable bundles. Is there a, yes. a variation on that that now would use these, the, the, the um, uh, moduli spaces that you are able to construct for these uh, unstable strata? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's an interesting question. So um, <laughs> you, could, you could certainly ask about the cohomology of these moduli spaces of unstable objects. Um, and in order to do that, you need results on um, homology of um, non-reductive GIT quotients. And so um, 
Greg Berkstein and Francis Cohen have um, a paper, I forget the title, it has moment maps in the in the title, I remember that. Um, but they have a paper where they um, they um, they prove results about cohomology of these cohomology of these U hat and, and H the certain nice um, hypotheses. So those results or generalizations of those results would be the things that um, you would uh, you would need if you were going to uh, compute the cohomology of these um, moduli of un unstable things. I also have some questions about application one. Um, so, uh -huh. so, so you said that the idea is to construct moduli for unstable objects as well as semi-stable ones. Do I understand right. correctly, though, that your construction still requires you to get rid of some unstable part of this unstable part, something that's unstable with respect to your non-reductive GIT setup? Yes, yes. So you should think of it as a sort of recursive process. Um, in, other, in other words, you know, you first question the, um, the semi-stable locus, and then you fix some particular unstable stratum. Within that stratum, you're going to try to use non-reductive GIT to quotient that, but you're not going to get a quotient of all of that stratum. You're absolutely right. There'll be some stuff which is unstable there. So there's a kind of recursive process that you, you uh, need to apply. Um, there's a paper um, by... Um, Greg Berksey and Vicky Hoskins and Francis Cohen, I think that's all the authors, which is called something like um, Stratifying Quotient Stacks and Moduli Stacks. And in that paper, they give uh, a sort of algorithm, if you want, like a recursive process for how you'd, um, you'd carry this out for, for unstable strata. Um, but the, the idea is that, you know, eventually this thing would exhaust, if you want to put it this way, it would exhaust the whole stack. So everything would have its moduli space that it lives in. Um, you're just going to have to go through this recursive process to split it up into, in some sense, the smallest number of manageable pieces that will that will play well together. I see. And is there any way to think about all of those different moduli spaces as inside of one object? Are the, do the moduli spaces themselves form a stratification of something? Yeah. So you can you can think of it as a stratification on the on the on the stack, mm -hmm. right? So um, if you have, a, I don't know, vector bundles on a curve, you can think about the stack of all vector bundles on that curve. And that has a, a stratification by Hardin and Seaman type. So that would be the natural place where all of these things, uh, all of these things live. And if you wanted to understand how these different moduli spaces kind of fit together, then I would think that the stack is the, is the, is the place to do that. Because um, from this, this process that I've described, you, you don't really get any information about how these things fit together because the whole point is if you want there to be a nice say separated quotient you have to you have to keep them apart from each other um so i think you'd have to use other methods to understand um how they fit together uh, sorry. are there other questions in the room uh, are there questions in Ibadan as well i think we have a question here yes so that um for the benefit of the people in Cambridge, the, the question was about um was about differential equations and whether <clears throat> whether the um, the uh, this sort of point of view on G a J actions as as uh, locally nilpotent derivations gives you anything that's related to um, to differential equations. And um, I suppose my somewhat vague answer to that would be that um, whenever you're whenever you're in the business of um, computing the invariance for a G A action. You can equivalently view that as computing the kernel of one of these locally nilpotent derivations. So, in some sense, finding GA invariance corresponds to solving some differential equations because you've got some kind of differential operator that you're applying, and you want to know what gets killed by that operator. Um, so, um, I think that point of view has been developed by other people. Um, the um, the book that I mentioned, which is called 
algebraic theory of locally potent derivations. It's a whole book where they write about this kind of stuff. Um, and I think there's going to be, there's probably a lot of stuff in there which would probably answer your question. Um, the, from the point of view of non-reductive GIT, it's not because we're, the whole point of GIT in some sense, as I've tried to make clear, is that we don't compute the invariance because we view that as just like too hard. So the actually solving these differential equations would correspond to something that we think is much too hard for us to do. And so we don't try to do it. But if you wanted in a specific example to actually work out what the invariants are, you can formulate that as a question about, you know, which things are in the kernel of this of this derivation. So that, that would be where you'd see differential equations come up, I think. But it'll be interesting to talk more about it and see if we can see if we can find interesting examples where you see, you know, differential equations that you know showing up. All right. So if there are no other questions, I think we can all thank Joshua for his very nice lectures. <laughs>